every chain will break His broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Oh, 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 oh. So open up the gate. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the light. God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Oh, every knee, oh, every knee will bow. Stop, Lord Almighty. Who can stop, Lord Almighty? Who can stop, Lord Almighty? And who can stop, Lord Almighty? Who can stop, Lord Almighty? Yeah. Who can stop, the Lord Almighty? Stop, Lord Almighty, yeah. And who can stop the Lord? Our God is the light, the light of Judah. He is roaring with power and fighting our battles. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is. Our God is the light, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before
gentle whisper in the noise. Father, tell me everything's all right. Yeah, your power, your presence breaks strong.
Amen. What's up, church? How are we doing? Good. Hey, I want to just start off by acknowledging that there are, there are more and more faces every week of people, and I'm, I'm looking around and seeing faces that I have not seen in a long time, and uh, just makes our heart so glad to see you guys. And so uh, welcome. I'm just glad that you can be here. Um, I know that there's more and more of you every week that are getting to that point where you're able to come into church. And so just want to acknowledge those of you in the room that I see and see some of those faces and just want you to know I love you so much. We thought of you a lot over this last year and it is so good to see you guys with us this morning. And so, um, man, the other thing that I just want to acknowledge is I think a lot, like a lot of you, uh, woke up Tuesday morning. I didn't even see the news of what had happened in Boulder until Tuesday morning. And so, uh, uh, I was on my way to school with our kids, and we listened to Totally Trivial Trivia every morning on Cozy 101.1. Anybody else in the room? And uh, t- 
turned that on, and they had, they had caught something about what had happened. And, and my kids are getting to the age, I'm, I'm not used to this. Katie and I were just talking, we're not really used to this in parenting yet, where uh, we're actually having to engage in these conversations early with our kids because they're coming up on nine and seven now. And so they were like, wait, what, what happened? You know, they heard a little bit. Of, they weren't doing the trivia game because it felt too small, I guess, in light of what had happened. They were reflecting on what had happened. And so I had to explain to my kids, and I, you know, I'm grateful that I got the first take at a conversation with them. I know they're probably going to hear about it from somebody at school, so I'm glad as a dad I got to have that conversation with them and hold it in light of the gospel that, yes, this world is terribly broken, terribly broken, and there are tragic things that still happen, but that is why we place our hope and our faith in Jesus, and that is why we have to be compelled to go share that good news, especially in a week like this where we think about Holy Week coming up. This is the time where people are seeking spiritual things. And so that put a new urgency in me, I guess. But then even just driving away from the school after letting them go, um, just was kind of overcome with emotion. Uh, thinking about Officer Eric Talley, um, you know, one of the names that are listed among the other nine uh, people who lost their life that day. Um, and I just, I wanted to take a moment at the front of this service just to acknowledge um, that loss and that that man uh, put on that uniform, knowing the risk that morning. He kissed his seven kids goodbye. He kissed his wife goodbye that morning, and he ran towards danger to save other people. And that is admirable. It is honorable. And so I, I just, I don't know how that all lands on you. I know I certainly, I had to go to Walmart for something on Wednesday, and it was just a little odd. Like, it was a little strange. Like, I had this feeling in me as I walked into Walmart. And so um, and I just, I couldn't help but think of the officers that do this every single day. And so if you have, uh, if you are an officer, if you have family that's an officer, a son, a daughter, um, a parent, would you just stand and we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray for you. And I don't even know if there are any in this service, in this room. I know there are a couple of second service, but I just, like, listen, you may not be a police officer, Mary Nadow, but like, knowing somebody who is, you carry that burden as well. And so I can't, I can't really see the balcony if there's people standing up here, but I just want, like, you feel that every morning in a way that we don't. And so I want to take a moment and I want to pray for you right now. And so church, uh, I'm going to let you pray for her first, pray for Don and Mary first, and then I'll join in and close in just a moment. So let's take a second. And you can even lift up another officer or someone else, family that you know in your own life. And so let's just take a minute and pray for those people. God, we are overwhelmed with gratitude for those who put on that uniform to keep us safe. For the men and women who are willing to enter in and who who woke up Tuesday like the rest of us, but they knew the risk they were taking even more when they put it on. And so God, I pray for the families of those affected by this tragedy. I pray for the families of those who have peace officers in their family who are, who are feeling this weight and this pain. And I just ask that you would be with them and that you would comfort them and that you would give them a peace that surpasses understanding. That there is no greater love than to, than to lay down your life for someone that you know, some of your friends, and for people that you don't even know. We just are, we are overwhelmed with gratitude for, for those people that, that risk their lives to keep us safe. Jesus, we, we lift your name on high and we ask that you would reign supreme in this situation. I, I think of all the, the, the families that are impacted by this. I think of the community of Boulder and we just pray for them. We pray that you would uh, be present, that you would harvest souls in this time, that you, would, that you would rise up a church that would go out and would meet people in the middle of their grief, in the middle of their shock, in the middle of their fear, God. And would there be people who have encountered you that go out now and start to witness and proclaim your good news to those that are hurting. Jesus, we love you, and we need you. We need you all the more. Pray that you'd come, Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Don and Mary. And I, if there's anybody else, I, I wish I could see you, but I can't in the balcony. So um, I want to jump right into the text today. And so if you want to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, uh, we're going to be uh, reading a lengthier story in Scripture here. And this is, this is I'll just give you like kind of my cards down. We're talking about courage today. We're talking about courage, and what I want to do is I want to look at this story. I want to explore the topic of courage. I want to look at what that word really means, and, and, and then I want to explore this verse to ask ourselves, okay, what does courage actually look like biblically, and how do we get it? How do we get 
courage. And so if you want to open up Acts chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 5. And I would love for you to just uh, read along somewhere. If you take notes, we're going to have a couple things that I want to be intentional about you circling or you writing down so that you have this with you for the week to come. So we're starting in Acts chapter 4, verse 5, and, and let me kind of set the setting here. So what's just happened is Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. They're going to the temple to pray, and as they go into the temple, they encounter a, a man who cannot walk. He cannot walk since birth. He's been lame since birth, and he's sitting at the temple gate, and he's begging. He's begging, and, and he reaches out, and he says, uh, Peter responds to him and says, food, I don't have any food, gold and silver, I don't have for you, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And it says that this man's bones and his muscles were strengthened, and he stood up and he walked. This amazing thing that happens, and, and, and all of a sudden now that puts all the religious leaders on notice, because they're going, wait, who did what? Uh, we got to get control of this, we got to figure out what's going on, and, and they bring in Peter and John, they arrest Peter and John, and they put them in front of the council. So they're standing now in front of the who's who of powers who we're going to read in this first, in this first few sentences here. They are, they are literally in front of the people who had the authority, had the power to, to ruin their life, to take their life. I mean, all, everything was kind of hinging in front of the people that they are now talking to, okay? So that's kind of the setting that we find Peter and John in here. It says, on the next day, after being arrested and in jail overnight, on the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. Halls of power, that's where they're sitting, is in the halls of power. And when they had sat them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, see that line, know that we're in this series called According to the Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, says to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what, means, by what means this has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders, which has become the cornerstone. They're saying, he's saying everything that you've built your life off of, this whole house that you've constructed on religion, all hinges on this one person. This one cornerstone is Jesus and you rejected him. And there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, 13, my life verse. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, common men. That word uneducated, it can be translated into the, it's the same word that we get the English word idiot from. Just a couple of regular dudes that aren't that smart, and they were astonished. Why? Because they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. It's funny how miracles somehow speak louder than theology at times. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them. They threatened them. They intimidated them. They bullied them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Well, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you be the judge. But for us, for we cannot help but speak of what we've seen and heard. I want you to underline that verse, Acts 4.20. Underline that, circle that, get that in your bones this morning. For we cannot help but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the men on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. I'm going to skip down to verse 27. It says, Truly this city there were gathered together against your holy servants, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And this is their prayer that they've gathered together. And it says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. 
And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did they do? They continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Boldness, courage. I want to talk about this idea of courage because I think it is, it is a virtue that allows you to actually consistently live who you really are on the inside. It's just, it's this valuable, valuable thing. And it's most easily defined like this. Um, Courage is the ability to do something that frightens you. We can't really reduce it down any more simply than that. It's It's the ability to do something that frightens you. Notice that the action is the imperative. Without the action, there's no courage. Without the action, you you cannot be this courageous person if you aren't actually moving towards the problem. So you have to have also, the second component would be fear. Fear. There's something in front of you that's daunting. Without, without like, like courage in and of itself is predicated on the presence of a problem. Do you get that? Like there has to be something wrong for there to be courage. And so for us to operate in courage, we have to understand that like courage doesn't come when we build our life around comfort. Courage, courage comes when we understand that no, there is fear in this world. I'm seeking a way to rise above that fear and to do something about it. I think that courage, um, courage is going to look different for all of us then because fear looks different for all of us then. I was trying to kind of just think down. There's no slides for this, but I think if you could reduce fear into a few different categories, uh, you have the fear of man. So you kind of have the fear of being rejected, the fear of what other, people's think, other people think about you. You might be afraid of being humiliated or, or being unwanted by somebody. There's the fear of failure. The fear of failure, like you might be exposed. You might be found out that you're kind of a fraud, like you're not really who you really are. Uh, you might be, might be outed as unsuccessful, not accomplishing everything you set out to accomplish. You might be afraid that you have missed potential in your life. For some of you like type A's, that's like one of your bigger fears is that, man, maybe I'm just not doing and capitalizing on everything that I could capitalize on. Or maybe I'm just afraid I'm not even going to engage with something. I'm not even going to try and do something because I'm afraid of being incompetent. I think all of that comes down to this fear of failure. There's the fear of pain fear of death, the fear of maybe just being uncomfortable, the fear of being deprived, not having something that you wish you had. But, but courage is the ability then to rise above whatever that fear is and then to act. And so I love a couple, I have a couple quotes here about courage. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a pastor during the World War II era, says that being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing the will of God. And see, so like, You think how many people then have reduced Christianity down to this kind of like ascent of moral behavior? Or I just got got to act a certain way. I got to do certain things. I got to not do other things. And that like, that is just so boring. That is such a boring way to live out your faith. You were called so that you can courageously and actively do the will of God. St. Augustine, I love this quote that he has. He says, hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage anger at the way things are. Like, I think there's part of us when we see something that happens, like what happened on Monday, we can be angered. We can be saddened. We can be angry. But then we also have to have courage, courage to see to it that they do not remain the way that they are. That's where hope is born. When, yes, we, we have anger, but we move forward in courage. Everyone's courage is going to look different because not everyone's fears are the same. I've had so many people who like come up to me and they're like, how do you stand up and talk in front of a bunch of other people? And I'm like, honestly, I don't, like, I don't really know. I don't really know. Like, it, it is kind of frightening to me, but it's not, it's, I don't really see this as a courageous act. I, I, I have, in reflection from this sermon, like, realizing that, man, you know what? I have, I have areas in my life where I'm not so courageous. I have things that look courageous to a lot of people. And so if I want to act a certain way, like I'm courageous, I have, I have spaces where it's like, man, okay, I can get up and talk, and I can open up the Bible and say whatever it says. And I have courage to do that. I don't know, like, I just, I just do that. There's not a lot of fear presence. So there's not a lot of courage there. But man, get me on the one-on-one, talking with somebody, uh, trying to go reach out and talk to a stranger. There are times, I mean, honestly, where I'm going to back out of those conversations that I know I need to enter into. And so I can have cowardice in my life because that is the contrast. If you're not courageous, then you have areas where you are a coward. And so um, this, is, this is how we can kind of break it down. Cowardice would be that my fear is greater than my desire and it leads me to then inaction. So if I have a fear that kind of doesn't move me, I have a fear that's too great and my desire to overcome that fear is not big enough, my fear is actually bigger, then I don't do anything. I'm inactive. But courage then would be fear that that is 
that is present. Remember, you have to have, you have, to have fear present if you're going to be courageous. And so that fear is then diminished or it's overpowered by my desire to write something. And therefore I act, I do, I run towards, I get involved. Do you see that? And it's important that we contrast these two because the Bible is going to contrast these two. Look at this verse in Revelation. Revelation 21, it's this beautiful picture of what heaven's going to be like someday. And, and death is going to be no more. And there's going to be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. And then it says this, the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sor- the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Can I level with you all for a second? I wish that verse didn't read like that. But it does. But it does. I'm like, really? Cowardice fits in that list? Man, that's, that's a lot of like bad things. What's up with that? Like, why is the cowardly the first one listed? Because I think, honestly, if you have cowardice in your heart, you're going to be unable to live out the values that are in your heart, and you're not going to be able to actually carry those out into the world that you live in. And so as soon as there's a fear that becomes bigger than your desire to live out who you really are, then that's, it's going to be you living as a coward. I was up praying this morning, getting ready for the message, and I feel like some of you, some people in this room today, that you feel like you have a problem with faith. And you think, oh man, I'm just not as faithful as I want to be. I have a problem believing. I have a problem moving in faith because I keep doing this thing that I don't want to do. Maybe you don't have a problem with faith. Maybe you have a problem with courage. Maybe you need to actually be infused with courage so that you can rise above that fear that's present so that you can act the way that you know you need to act. The reason I think that cowardice is listed in this list is because cowardice, it keeps us from being who we really are. And as soon as the peer pressure comes in, as soon as the temptation comes in, we start acting contrary to who we are in our heart. And we give in to whatever, whatever's happening in culture, whatever's happening in the workplace, whatever's happening, you name it. We just give over. We don't stand firm on Jesus. And so the question then becomes, okay, so like what is courage? Let's talk about courage. Um, there's three things that I want to pick up out of this verse, out of this story that we just read out of Acts chapter 4. And, and I want you to see a few things in here. And the first is that we cannot just be courageous physically. We must be courageous spiritually. I, I believe, like I've talked with enough of you, there are enough courageous people in our congregation, courageous men, courageous, courageous women who would, um, I mean, man, some of y'all, like, you're just like, I would, I would love to just see some scenario where I could just run up on some dude that was acting a certain way. Right, And I would, I would be overcome with this desire to just uh, take out the evil in the world. And you would have this physically courage like in spades. Like you would just be willing to run through a fire to save a baby. Like it wouldn't matter. You are courageous dudes, courageous women. But that's not what we see in this verse. See, in this verse, Peter and John are in front of people who can take their lives. So there is physical courage. Physical courage is absolutely important. But what we see in this, in this story primarily is spiritual courage. Spiritual courage for for Peter and John to just witness about their God. And you notice like Peter, he's kind of savage in the story. He's like, well, 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 Jesus, who you crucified, the cornerstone that you rejected. Like I just picture this story of Peter's just got his finger out probably. And he's just like pointing them down. And he's just like saying, no, listen, I'm going to share the gospel. It's Jesus. There's there's salvation through nobody else. It's through Jesus. And he's being courageous spiritually to say, no, he's going to, he's the only one that can save you. And so we have, like, for all of you, like, I mean, I think we've got some just like alpha dudes and you're just like, you got no fear. You're just so brave, so courageous, so bold. And I just want to ask you, are you that courageous with your faith? Are you that courageous to just share, like, share the, like, the the touchy parts of who you are? Say, no, listen, God has saved me from this. God picked me up when I was here. Like, we can get so, we can get so, like, and and I'm not saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't love to see Uh, physical courage. Like I think of Officer Eric Talley, and I I mean every bit of what I just said, that man, for him to have courage, to answer that call, to be the first officer to respond, and for him to lose his life, that is a courageous, bold, honorable man. But we can't only see courage that way. We can't only see boldness that way. Church, like if we're going to fulfill the mission of God, if you think back a few weeks ago, what we talked about is we're now pivoting to see not just us living according to the Spirit so that we might build ourselves up, but we want to live according to the Spirit, partnering with what God is doing around us. 
And that's going to take a spiritual boldness to go out and proclaim the good news of who God is and what he's done. That's what it's going to take. We can't just settle for physical courage. We have to also engage with it spiritually. The second thing that I notice is that we're always more courageous when we have coworkers. We're always more courageous when we have coworkers or co-laborers. When you're doing something with someone, that's where we get encouraged. You think about that word, encouraged, to be infused with courage. That often comes from another. Paul, when he's writing to the Thessalonian church, he says, encourage one another. Encourage, like, man, champion one another. Get, behind, get with one another. And that happens best when you're co-laboring, when you're working together. So, I, like, I was the youth pastor a few years ago, right? And I uh, love this game, Savage Women. Any survivors of, like, early 2000s youth group that are like, yeah, Savage Women, I played that. Let me give you the premise of the game. You give all the guys in the room like two, three minutes to just make the most interwoven, like locked together brotherhood that there could be. And it's intimate and you're close and it gets warm quick. You know what I'm saying? All these like middle school, high school kids and you get together and you just like lock arms. And the mission of that moment is brothers, we do not let go. We no. doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter what they grab. Doesn't matter what they pull. We're not letting go. And then you tell the girls of the youth group, you put a five-minute timer on is what we did. And I said, hey, five minutes, no man left together. If there's, if there's dudes still holding on to one another, they win. If there's all of them are pulled apart, the girls win. What are the rules? No rules. Go. You know, like just whatever you need to do, just try and rip them apart. And I remember like a couple years ago, this, this high school kid, Bennett, I still know him, still love him. And like we were like a couple of the last guys. And I'm like, I'm like legs wrapped around his legs, like arms wrapped around him. And it's like Titanic that moment, right? I'm like, I'll never let you go, Bennett. I'll never let you go. Like I promise no matter what. These girls are yanking on every part of us. You know, I'm just like, I'll never let go. And we held on. It was a miracle. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, I was in that moment together. When, like, when you're together with somebody, you have this way of going like, man, I can do more than I can do alone. I can hold on longer. I can fight further. I can go longer than I could by myself. I have a brother co-laboring with me. I have a sister co-laboring with me. This is what it's going to take if we're going to be courageous. We need to be encouraged by one another. We need to be built up in love by one another. I think that this is so, this is such a good point. And this is so hard, but we know we have to have courage to encourage one another. We also have courage to admonish one another. Both are listed in the New Testament to, given to the church where we say, hey, listen, like, do you have a friend? I hope you have a friend. I hope you are the kind of friend who gets behind your friends and you say, let's go. You're doing great. No, you can do this. You, I know you've got that interview. I know you're scared. You can do this. I know that diagnosis just came. Hey, you can, listen, I'm praying for you. I'm with you. Whatever you need, we're behind you. Like, I hope you have those people in your life. I hope you are being that kind of person to somebody where you're encouraging them. But we also are called to admonish. And that's the harder one. Let's be honest. Sometimes that conversation takes more courage. We have to say to a friend, hey, that's good, but it's not good enough. Hey, listen, you, you went, what, where, were you, where were you on Friday night? Where'd you go? No, listen, hey, no, we got to have this conversation. You're, you're beyond that. You're better than that. You don't, you don't behave that way anymore. God has saved you from that. You're not going back. And we have to be courageous enough to do both together because we're not in this alone. We're in this together. We're co-laboring for the glory of God together as the church. The last thing is more, how do we get courage? How do we get it? Because I think a lot of us are going like, okay, I can see maybe how courage looks. I I know what it feels like, but more often than not, I think people are just going, yeah, but that's not me. I'm not courageous. So how do I just all of a sudden in a moment, like, do I just muster it up? Do I just like all of a sudden decide, all right, I'm going to be courageous one day? So let's talk about for a sec where I think courage comes from. Uh, Any of y'all find it ironic that Peter's the guy in the courage story? If you you know your Bible, like the reason people are laughing right now is because two months before this, we're talking like 50 and change days before this moment when Peter's like shouting down the high priest and he's got his finger out and he's probably spitting everywhere, you know. He's all bold. He's all courageous. Peter was in front of a, a servant girl the night that Jesus was crucified, right? And Jesus had told him, you're going, to me three, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows the next morning. And this girl's like, hey, aren't you that guy that runs with Jesus? And, and Peter, so bold and courageous Peter, in that moment, he's like, no, I don't, I don't know him. I don't know him. Somebody else comes up, they're like, hey, no, you're, yeah, you're, you're one of them. And he's like, no, 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 not, hey, not me, not me. He denies Jesus three times. One of probably the more cowardly moments, I would say, ever captured in Scripture, where he's just so unwilling 
to, to profess his faith in Jesus, to admit that he'd walked with him, just to even admit that he knew him. And as soon as that rooster crows, Jesus turns and looks, and it says that, Jesus, uh, that Peter wept bitterly. Peter wept bitterly. And some, I think some of you guys probably feel that way, where you're like, man, I've just, I've just let him down so much. There's been moments where I knew I need to say something, I need to pray for someone, I need to talk to someone, I need to go do this thing, I need to serve this person, and you've bowed out, and it's been cowardly. And you're going, how do I, man, how do I, how do I just drum up more courage? Listen, I think Peter's courage primarily came from an encounter with God's love. An encounter with God's love. You, you notice that he encountered the Holy Spirit. Like it's unmistakable as we talk about walking according to the Spirit, that, that it's the Holy Spirit who's present and operating in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit pours out and all of a sudden Peter, he doesn't just overnight in his own strength, like just muster up this courage and boldness, but all of a sudden now he's preaching sermons to people. And he's in front of the halls of power, like proclaiming that Jesus is the only way. That even though you crucified Jesus and you might be able to take my life, I'm still going to tell you what it is. He had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. We can't, we can't miss that. That somehow in our, in our praying, in our seeking after the Lord, when we, the moments where we feel like cowards, we have to go, Holy Spirit, would you fill me up with courage? Would you just, would you just give me some boldness right now? Like, like here's the crazy thing. God is never going to give you an assignment that he's not going to empower you to fulfill. He's never going to. Like, and so when you have that moment where you're in the supermarket and you see that person, I, I always use the supermarket. I don't know why. It's always the example, but it's just, I'm going to probably keep coming back to it for the rest of my life. It's just who I am, okay? At the gym, at your office, wherever you are, and you have that moment where you think you need to go pray for someone and you just need to maybe go check in on somebody. You see somebody who just looks down, they look out, and you need to go just offer to pray for them, right? And we, and we start throwing up all the excuses. Like, well, I, you know, like, do, they really, do I really need it? It seems like everything's okay. Like maybe I, uh, I don't know. And we, we back out. But that's the Holy Spirit nudging you to just go, just go love on somebody. I think we get so convinced like that I can't be courageous because I don't know all the answers. Like, uh, like that, was, that was me for a long time. I just didn't feel confident enough in my, in my knowledge of the Bible. And this random person at the gym is probably going to be some like Hebrew scholar who can disprove all my points. And so I'm like, I can't go share my faith because, you know, they'll just like, they'll know all this stuff that I don't know. But you know what witnesses like crazy? Just going up to somebody, how are you? How are you? Hey, hey could, could I pray for you about something? It seems, like, it seems like something's bothering you. Could I pray for you? What's going on? And then, like, yeah, maybe somebody will have hard questions. Some people do. Like, they have really hard questions. Answering, answering, like, how do you reconcile a good God with what happened on Monday in Boulder? That's a good question. You know what? Like, I, I, don't, I don't totally know. That's an okay answer. That is an okay answer. But we come back to Acts 4.20. Don't let that stop you from telling people what you know, what you do know. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. If you've encountered Jesus, and like I'm looking at it in this room, I don't see a lot of new people in this room today that don't know Jesus. You know him. He's done something in your life. You've seen him move. You've heard him speak to you. You know he's there. You know he's real. And yes, I know that thing in front of you is scary, but you need to let your desire swell bigger than that fear. And you just need to ask, Holy Spirit, if you're putting this thing in front of me, then you will, you will give me some stuff. I love the verse that says, don't, don't prepare, but let the Holy Spirit speak to you in the moment, right? And I could use that for sermons if I wanted to, but I try not to. I think that would just be bad practice. It's just like, oh, the Holy Spirit will give me something on Sunday. Let's just roll up and try, you know? It's, like, you can use that poorly for sure. I'm never going to learn about, never going to learn about Jesus. I'm never going to study scripture because in the moment, like, the Holy Spirit will just give me the answers. That's, that's not how we take that. We say, man, don't let all of your preconceived ideas of how it's going to go wrong keep you from ever trying, just go, go talk to somebody. Have a real conversation with somebody. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let him guide you. And when he speaks, respond. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Maybe, maybe you're in this spot where you're like, man, I just feel like it's been a dry season. The Holy Spirit's not speaking to me as much as he was. I don't feel like I'm hearing the voice of God. And my question is, have you been doing the things he's been asking you to do? Have you been going into the places he's calling you to go? Have you been talking to the people that he's been putting on your heart? Have you been praying for the people that he's putting on your heart? Man, if we can engage with the Holy Spirit as a person, realize that that's a relationship. And as we make room for him to speak to us, and as we respond to him as a person, not as a force, not as a thing, not as an it, but as the person of God, as we actually respond and get involved, he's going to fill us up with boldness and courage to do the things that he's calling us to do. Because they're assignments given by God for us to go get involved. 
The second thing is that, that Peter absolutely encounters the love of God. So he encounters the Holy Spirit and he encounters God's love. It's probably one of the more beautiful stories in all of Scripture where Peter has this just cowardly, cowardly moment where he's in front of a girl who can do nothing to him. And all he has to do is say, yes, I know Jesus. Instead, he bows out, right? And he has those three denials. Three times he denies Jesus. The rooster crows. Jesus looks at him and he weeps. I mean, he's just probably a trainer. Can you imagine? I don't think any of us could actually imagine. I mean, he walked with Jesus. He was present at the transfiguration moment. He saw all these miracles happen. He knew Jesus so well. And he denied him on the day that Jesus needed him most. And he just failed him. Like he messed up. But God, coming back after when Jesus has been resurrected, visits Peter and he gives him three chances. How beautifully redemptive is that? Three times he denies him. Three times Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? It's almost as if that moment is what Peter needed to be reconciled back to God, to understand that no, no matter how many times we mess up, Jesus' love is right there waiting for us. And so yes, maybe you've been terribly cowardly in your life before, and maybe you've missed so many opportunities. God's love is still right there waiting for you. He is not, he's not done with you. He has not written it off. He is still ready to move. And, G, and when Peter encounters that love, man, the trajectory of his life begins to change. All the way to the fact that he's like, he's not only preaching sermons, he's asking for miracles, he's crying out for miracles, he's bold, he's courageous, telling the people who, who helped crucify Jesus, he's telling them what it is, he's pointing his finger at him, he's getting all up in their face, all the way up until his death where he's crucified upside down. Peter, this this man who all of a sudden went through this dramatic transformation. Why? Because he encountered the love of God. And so, man, next time that you bow out, next time that you turn and run, next time that you act like a coward, just remember that God still loves you. It's Palm Sunday, right? Palm Sunday. And on this day, um, I find it like to be an ironic day because we celebrate Jesus's triumphal entry. And we get so excited about these crowds cheering out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? And they're so excited that Jesus is coming back into Jerusalem. They're going, oh my gosh, yes, Hosanna, save us, help us. This is our savior. They're crying out in worship. And it's going to be a few days later that these same crowds are going to be the same people yelling, crucify him, crucify him. No, don't give us Jesus. Give us Barabbas instead, right? And so Jesus, what I want you to see is that Jesus ultimately is the most courageous person. He's the most courageous person because he came into Jerusalem. Everyone else was expecting this mighty conquering king and he was a mighty conquering king. It just didn't look the way that the people wanted it to look. They wanted him to start immediately overthrowing Rome with power and force. But instead he came in to die on a cross. He came in and he laid down his life. And, and you picture the garden at Gethsemane. You think of like, okay, courage has to have fear present. And you, we never maybe want to articulate it this way that Jesus was afraid of the cross. But then what was the garden of Gethsemane when he's weeping so hard that he's sweating drops of blood saying, Father, if there's any other way to let this cup pass from me, let it be done. But if not, not, if not God, it's not my will, it's yours. I just want to do what you want me to do. And so he's able then to go to the cross courageously, boldly, because he's compelled by love. And so we have to understand that it's God's love that compels us, that raises up that desire so that we can, yes, still be afraid of certain things, but our love for the people that we're going to interact with is greater than that fear. It doesn't matter if you're afraid of being uh, hurt. It doesn't matter if you're afraid of man and being uh, cut off from friends or, or like set, set back in the workplace. Whatever your fear is, you have to understand God's love more so that you can rise above that fear and act and do and get involved. That's the only way. And so like, look, this week is, is Holy Week and we're coming up on Easter Sunday. And I, I was kind of thinking to myself, man, what an, what an odd year to invite people to church for Easter. Right, like Kate and I are having this conversation. We got some people who were like, I don't, I don't know if we should invite them to church for Easter. Man, they're so, they're so like a certain way with COVID. They might, they might just stop being friends with us because they know that we go to a public gathering on Easter Sunday. And that's real, right? But man, church, this is the greatest story that's ever been told. Like we, we can't let anything stop us from sharing the story of what Jesus has done in our life. 
We can't. And so maybe it's not church on Sunday morning. Maybe it is church next Sunday morning. Maybe you could say, hey, listen, there's a high-risk service at 7.30, and I'll go with you. And they might say, you come with me at 7.30? Man, something is different about you. <laughs> like you, might just, you might just witness to somebody right there just saying, I'll get up at 7.30 on Easter morning, and I'll come, to you with, come with you to church. But I'm, like, we've, we've tried so hard, so many ways, and this will always be the message, is that it's not my job to evangelize to your friends. It's not my job to evangelize to your coworkers. It's your job primarily. It's your role to be telling of the good things that God has done in your life. You need to be filled with courage and boldness. And even though you might be an uneducated, common person, it should be clear that you've spent time with Jesus. However, on Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, I will be laying out the gospel best I know how and talking about life according to the Spirit, resurrection life, because we're not just Good Friday people. We're Resurrection Sunday people also. Both are, both are important. Both are critical. We don't get here without both. We don't get here without the cross. We don't get here without the empty tomb. And so we love them both. And I just want to say, man, so maybe it's inviting some friends to church next week. I, I have two names. I have two names written down in my journal. And, and I, I know these people. I've been talking to these people. I've been sharing my life and who Jesus is. And, and one of them works out at my gym. One of them's a, a, a friend's brother. And I'm going to invite them both to church. I'm just going to say, hey, listen, like I've, I've been, you know who I am. You know where I stand. Would you come to church? Would you come to church with me on Easter Sunday? And so like, I believe that there are people in your life, in your mind, on your heart right now who you know need to hear the gospel. And my ask is that you invite them next week. Don't let that be the only conversation they ever hear about Jesus. If they're your friend, man, bring them and then maybe you pick up the conversation with them. You start telling them. You start filling in the gaps for them. You start piecing some of this together. And Lord help us. Like if we just, if we don't ever engage because we have questions ourselves about the Bible or we have things that we don't know how to answer, like we're never going to get anywhere. We're never going to be able to share our faith and actually reach the kingdom and actually spread the kingdom if we write ourselves off be going, oh, well, I, I, don't, I don't speak that great a Hebrew. Nobody speaks that great a Hebrew. <laughs> but you can share what Jesus has done in your life with people. And so I just want to, I just want to sit for a minute now as we kind of close today. I want to pray. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would shake us up. I love the last kind of closing line in here. It says they were gathered together. I love, like part of this story is just so fun for me because they were they were threatened in front of the council. They were the the guys were like, hey, listen, I mean, we're probably we're going to beat you up if you keep talking about the gospel. If you keep talking about Jesus, like it's going to be problems for you. And they like immediately go and gather with their friends and they're like, hey, let's worship, let's talk, and let's pray. I just love that faith. I love that boldness. And it says, they were gathered together and the room they were gathered in was shaken. The room was shaken. How many of us would admit like on Sunday morning, I would just love for some Holy Ghost miracle just to break through. And I would love for this place to be shaken up. I'd love for just something crazy to happen. But notice, the Holy Spirit shook the room but they were filled to go out. They were filled to continue to speak the word of God with all boldness. So they were filled up so that we might not just stay there and seek another miracle. They weren't just gonna sit there and cry out for the Holy Spirit to break through and do something awesome. They were filled up so they could go and continue to preach and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And so I just wanna, I wanna pray that the Holy Spirit would just, would just fill us up today. And so if you would, um, even just sitting right where you are, you can stand if you want to, but I just want you to kind of posture yourself in this, in a way to receive. Well, God, we just pray that you would move. God, fill us up with courage and boldness. Would your Holy Spirit just speak to us in the, pace, in the places where maybe we maybe have cowered have been a coward or cowarded away from different situations. And God, would you just, would you maybe help us pick those conversations back up if we've moved away from one too quickly? I, I pray that even right now, all across this room, that you would be giving people the dose of courage that they need, wherever they're at. Maybe there are some people in this room that need more courage physically. And I pray that you would meet them in that. Give, give parents courage to have hard conversations with their kids. Give, give people who are, who are battling something that seems impossible, give them courage to keep going. Give them boldness to keep pressing, to keep fighting, to be unrelenting, God. And God, I pray for all of us to be filled up with a spiritual boldness. 
would we just would we just be unashamedly on team Jesus? Unafraid, unapologetic, not worried about who knows what about us, God, but would we just say, this is who I am and this is what Jesus has done with me? And would we just be unable to keep from sharing the good things that you've done in our heart? God, we love you and we need you. And I pray, God, for anyone who's maybe just in this moment, they're, they're ashamed, maybe ashamed of how cowardly they've been throughout their life. God, I pray that it would be your love that picks them up right now. That just like Peter, who had just this bitter moment of failure, God, would they encounter your love reaching out to them right now? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I pray that we'd turn to you. I pray that we'd fix our eyes on you, fix our gaze on you. Be with us this week. God, I pray for divine, interpoint, uh, divine appointments for each person in this room this week. Not that, that we might fill up this room on Sunday, but that we might fill up heaven. God, will we partner with what your Holy Spirit's doing to witness and proclaim and to, and to, and to preach your word to people in our life. God, we need you, we love you, and I pray that you would move and you would speak and you would lead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, God bless you, church. Happy Holy Week. We'll see you next Sunday.